You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed. Finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Growing up, Elaine Aaron did everything she could to avoid what she perceived to be chaos and overstimulation, whether it was from games, sports, or other children. Her struggles continued throughout college, where she often found herself crying in school bathrooms, worrying that she was going crazy. After several stops and starts, Aaron graduated Phi Beta Kappa at the University of California, Berkeley. After marrying fellow psychologist Dr. Arthur Aaron, she underwent a routine medical procedure. She expected to recover in a couple of weeks, but months later she was still suffering from extreme emotional and physical reactions. Aaron decided to see a psychotherapist, who told her after a few sessions that, of course you were upset, you are a very highly sensitive person. It was a light bulb moment for Aaron. Perhaps she didn't have a fatal flaw after all. Perhaps there were others out there, like herself, who were just naturally more sensitive, in both physiology and emotions. Erin wanted to discover everything that she could about this newfound trait. Her first stop were the works of psychology pioneer Carl Jung, who she believes was a highly sensitive person, or HSP. She even interned at the C.G. Jung Institute in San Francisco. Jung had done pioneering work on the study of introversion, but Aaron couldn't shake the feeling that there was a difference between introverts and highly sensitive people. She decided to investigate for herself, embarking on a research project that she continues today. The Highly Sensitive Person, How to Thrive When the World Overwhelms You, was the result of her inquiry. Published in 1996, it became a bestseller, with over a million copies sold. In this book insight, we'll explore the following key themes from the book. First, inside the mind of a highly sensitive person. Second, HSPs and their relationship with the world. And third, approaches to managing high sensitivity. We'll conclude by taking a look at the wider impact and legacy of Erin and her work, as well as addressing any potential criticisms. Aaron developed a series of questions to gauge whether or not someone displays highly sensitive tendencies. She accepts that this isn't an exact science, but is still valuable in assessing whether you have highly sensitive characteristics. This includes having a rich inner life, experiencing heightened sensitivity to pain, startling easily at loud noises or bright lights, or having an extreme aversion to seeing violent scenes on the screen. Here's Erin in an interview with Sherry Dyer. I define high sensitivity as a preference to process information more deeply, and that includes like startling easily and being more affected by caffeine, but mostly it's that we take in stimuli and somehow it gets used in a different way, a more thorough way than for a non-sensitive person. Let's take a look at an example from one of the highly sensitive people who Erin interviewed during her research. Kristen thought she was mentally unstable because she had always been different. Even though she had enjoyed a happy childhood, Kristen had a reputation for being grumpy. Loud music terrified her, and her teachers thought that she was stoned most of the time. She went through a battery of scans to test her hearing and brain function. Everything was normal. In Aaron's mind, Kristen simply found her world too stimulating. Aaron defines stimulation as anything that wakes up the nervous system, gets its attention, and makes the nerves fire off another round of the little electrical charges that they carry. We function best when we are neither overstimulated nor completely bored. We thrive when we receive the right kind of arousal, not too little and not too much. Given that no two people are the same, It makes sense that we all have varying degrees of capability to process stimulation. 
Some people can remain unaffected by large amounts of arousal, but others can start to feel overwhelmed quickly. Through a phone survey of 300 randomly selected people, Aaron found that 20% of people identified themselves to be the classic sensitive group. 27% of participants thought they were moderately sensitive. Extrapolated out to the world at large, it would mean that 1.4 billion people would identify themselves as highly sensitive. Aaron also came to the conclusion that high sensitivity is largely inherited. A 2007 study backed up her claims. Carried out by Boston University's Department of Psychology, it found evidence to suggest that sensory processing sensitivity is hereditary and distinct from generalized social anxiety. Studies have also linked emotional sensitivity to genes that control the function of brain chemicals such as dopamine and serotonin, both important for happiness and well being. Aaron published a study in 2010 called Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience. She found that the brains of highly sensitive people are wired differently. Their visual areas are more activated when they observe subtle changes in photographs presented to them. Simply put, the subjects were absorbing more stimuli from their environment compared to other people. Given this, it's no surprise that, at times, such people could become overstimulated. The heightened senses of the highly sensitive person also makes them more intuitive. They can predict the outcome of something with very little sensory input. And are often highly attuned to other people's emotional states. They tend to be very observant before taking any action. A 2014 study by Aaron, which appeared in Brain and Behavioral Journal, involved functional magnetic resonance imaging scans of both highly sensitive people and non highly sensitive people. In response to viewing happy and sad photos of their parents, The brain areas of highly sensitive people responsible for empathy and awareness lit up significantly more than the brains of the other group. There are other physiological differences with highly sensitive people. Aaron cites research from Harvard University psychologist Jerome Kagan. Kagan studied both inhibited and uninhibited kids and found that inhibited children, those who tend to be shy, introverted, or sensitive, generally had higher heart rates. When Kagan tested their bodily fluids, such as saliva and urine, he found that they had higher levels of norepinephrine, a hormone that jumps to action when the body is aroused. Aaron presents the case study of fraternal twins Rob and Rebecca, who were born to a close friend of hers around the time she began her investigations. Aaron noticed right away that their personalities were poles apart. Rob was the quintessential highly sensitive type. While his sister was very evidently not. One night, when Aaron stayed over to babysit the twins, Rob woke in the middle of the night and was extremely distressed that Aaron was there. Rebecca, on the other hand, was completely calm. Growing up, Rob would often burst into angry tears when he felt overwhelmed. He seemed to have developed irrational fears of a lot of things, such as pine cones, shadows, and shapes printed on bedsheets. A few years later, loud bands would irritate and upset Rob while they enthralled Rebecca. Both children had their own wonderful virtues, but they simply were so very different from each other, Aaron writes. At this point, Aaron brings in attachment theory. She notes the difference between children who grow up securely attached, meaning their primary caretakers support them to go out in the world and have new experiences, and insecurely attached. Children for whom new experiences are seen as a threat. Insecure attachment can be the result of overbearing, overprotective parenting, as well as neglectful and abusive parenting. Either extreme will have a damaging effect. Highly sensitive children benefit from a securely attached childhood. They learn to engage their anxieties and fears with the help of a supportive parent. An insecure childhood can make their sensitivity even worse by corroborating their belief that unfamiliar experiences aren't safe. Aaron found that highly sensitive people who have difficult, insecure childhoods are more likely to have mental health problems when they're older. As adults, 
highly sensitive people can feel the pressure to be constantly out of an evening or weekend. Aaron believes that our culture carries a lot of expectations, not only for our careers, but also for our personal lives, whether it's how many trips you've been on this year, how many restaurants you've tried in your town, whether you have enough friends, even how much sexual experience you're having. And let's not forget that Aaron was writing in 1996, before the stratospheric rise of social media and constant comparison. Some highly sensitive people feel they would like to shut off from the world completely. But an extreme form of introversion doesn't do them any good. The more you hide yourself from the world, the more vulnerable you're going to feel the next time you head out. Instead, you need to find a few challenges and try new ways to deal with the stress of those activities. Aaron says it is often the case that the more your body acts, looks out the window, goes bowling, travels, speaks in public, the less difficult and arousing it becomes. Let's take a break for now. But first, let's recap what we've covered so far. We've taken a look inside the mind of a highly sensitive person. A major percentage of the world's population can be estimated as a highly sensitive person. When we return to the highly sensitive person, we'll look at their relations with the world. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our exploration into the highly sensitive person, how to thrive when the world overwhelms you. It's published by best-selling author Elaine Aaron. Last time, we looked into the mind of a highly sensitive person, or HSP. Now, we'll look at how HSPs relate to the world around them. For many people, even therapists, the word shy is pejorative and associated with anxiety and timidity. For this reason, Aaron refers to the tendency to shyness as social discomfort. It's true that some sensitive people can also be shy, but sensitivity and shyness are not the same thing. Aaron explains, Shyness is the fear that others are not going to like or approve of us. Her research found that 30% of highly sensitive people are actually extroverts. They may not be fearful of a situation or worried about what other people think of them. They just have a tendency to feel overstimulated. Here's Aaron again in an interview with Sherry Dyer. We don't perform as well under those circumstances. A person can rehearse and rehearse alone for a recital and then they go on stage and they're so overstimulated by the lights in the crowd that they don't do as well. Historically, the world has been divided into two types of people. The aggressive types who rule and fight wars and the more thoughtful advisor type, priests, artists, and judges. These types counsel the aggressive types and persuade against rash and impulsive decisions. Highly sensitive people naturally gravitate towards the latter category. Aaron contends that this divide has informed how many business cultures have evolved. But that's not to say that all highly sensitive people are or should be therapists, academics, or theologians. In his book, Good to Great, management guru Jim Collins laid out his definition of the highest kind of leader, who exhibits what he calls level 5 leadership. These are the kinds of people who are massively ambitious for their enterprise at the same time as being personally humble. Highly sensitive people can be excellent level 5 leaders. They're intuitive, conscientious, and highly attuned to their surroundings and the well-beings of their colleagues. They're very unlikely to act hastily, steal the limelight, or try to cover up mistakes with bravura and posturing. Highly sensitive people are often quieter at work and don't like to play politics. They may only occasionally show up at after-work drinks or parties, and sometimes they pay a price for that. One of Aaron's clients, Bet, 
was concerned that she was being overlooked for promotion. She didn't understand why, but her intuition was that her boss had a thing against her. Bet eventually found material evidence to prove her theory. She asked to see her own file and discovered that her boss had been inputting negative notes that were simply untrue, while ignoring everything that Bet was doing well. Aaron helped identify why her boss might have been targeting her. Bet didn't socialize much with her colleagues and her boss, and could come across as aloof and cold, though she possessed neither of these qualities in reality. Her boss, who was younger, felt insecure and threatened around Bet. Bet also missed out on informal gossip sessions with the boss, so when she ran into trouble with the boss, her colleagues weren't interested in helping her out since they barely knew her. The boss found it easy to single out Bet because she knew no one would come to her aid. Bet also displayed a couple of traits common to highly sensitive people. She struggled to see the negatives in other people, and she tended to idolize her superiors. Both made it more difficult for her to understand what was going on in her work environment. The lesson for Bet was to have a functional relationship with her colleagues, to get some friends at court, and play a little politics without sacrificing her integrity. She needed to find her inner power broker. Bet also needed to understand that her demeanor could make others feel that they were being judged or rejected, again, neither of which were true. Whatever your profession, it's important to remember that the high sensitivity trait is not a flaw. And as with any trait, whether it's confidence or kindness or intelligence, there are upsides and downsides. Try to be aware of the downsides as Bet learned to be, but above all, embrace the upsides. In the workplace, the highly sensitive person's heightened intuition means that they are better able than most to see beyond the obvious and connect the dots. They also tend to be more conscientious than most and do not rest until the task at hand is complete. These are both qualities employers highly value. Moving on to the relationship sphere, Aaron says that highly sensitive people tend to spend a lot of time being alone, but their relationships can be quite varied too. It's in the nature of highly sensitive people to fall head over heels in love more often. At times, they're susceptible to the kind of intense, irrational love or crush that generally doesn't translate into a steady partnership, or it's simply unrequited. HSPs are very inwardly driven. When they do allow themselves to occasionally step out and meet people, they can be blown away very quickly by seemingly average people. That's why it's important to get out there, meet more people, and even fall in love with some of them. This way, you'll be less likely to be overwhelmed so easily by any one person. Are you more likely to fall in love with someone you met on a wavering suspension bridge swaying over a mountain gorge or a sturdy wooden bridge over a stream? A study by Arthur Aaron, Elaine's husband, showed that Cupid is more likely to strike people on the suspension bridge because it's a more arousing experience. Whether it's while exercising, watching an exhilarating film, or having some kind of adventure, we're more likely to be romantically attracted to someone when we're aroused. That's why highly sensitive people who are easily aroused are more likely to fall in love with the person they're with and to fall hard. A romantic relationship between two highly sensitive people can be fairly simple. Relationships with others are often more complicated. For example, highly sensitive types may always rely on their non-highly sensitive partner to look after potentially overwhelming life admin, such as banking and paying bills. On the other hand, the non-highly sensitive partner may have trouble comprehending their feelings such as jealousy and shame. The highly sensitive partner will be good at stepping in and helping them to empathize and manage their emotions. Highly sensitive types sometimes need to be firm with their non-highly sensitive partners, who may prefer to do things like nights out at a casino or thrill-seeking activities. They may have to be firm and just tell them they're not interested. But Aaron urges approaching this problem with tact. Ask yourself, do I want to stay home because I fear getting overstimulated, or is it because I'm really tired? If it's the latter, you can explain that to your partner. If it's the mere fear of stimulation, 
you may want to challenge yourself and head out. It could be good for you and good for the relationship. We'll take one last break before we conclude our discussion on The Highly Sensitive Person by Elaine Aaron. But first, let's recap. HSPs must understand how their sensitive nature often leads to misunderstandings. In business and relationships, your qualities might be overlooked or misinterpreted by non-highly sensitive persons. However, it's important to remember that the thoughtful, considerate qualities of HSPs are greatly esteemed in both fields. Next, we'll look at how to manage high sensitivity. Then we'll end with the book's legacy and criticisms. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our look into Elaine Aaron's best-selling book on high sensitivity. It's called The Highly Sensitive Person, How to Thrive When the World Overwhelms You. Last time, we covered how the world interacts with HSPs. Now we'll look at how to manage high sensitivity. Then we'll end by discussing the book's legacy and controversies. Throughout the book, Erin offers helpful suggestions for managing high sensitivity. She suggests reframing exercises whereby you consider an experience from a different perspective. This can mean trying to figure out aspects of the situation that sound familiar to you and that you've successfully coped with in the past. Try stepping out of the situation and observing yourself in third person. For example, Alex is experiencing stress right now because he has to go on a date. Last time, he stuttered in front of his date and that caused him anxiety. But after the first few minutes, he was able to be himself. Aaron also asks us to try and appreciate the situation and approach it from a position of curiosity. This technique might sound familiar to readers of Emotional Agility by Harvard psychologist Susan David, who encourages us to look at our negative states of mind with compassion and curiosity. Here's Aaron again from an interview with Sherry Dyer. That they can be overstimulated means more downtime, more rest. I say uh, eight hours in bed, whether you're asleep or not, and at least two hours during the day, but it just should be that your mind is free to drift. Aaron identifies four approaches to help highly sensitive people heal wounds and cope with life when it gets overwhelming. The first is cognitive behavioral therapy which takes a very rational and targeted approach to dealing with mental issues and which focuses on how our thoughts generate our feelings. CBT is now the most common form of talking therapy. The second approach, and one that HSPs may feel more relaxed about due to its intuitive nature, is interpersonal therapy. Interpersonal therapists employ a mix of different theories, Jungian, Freudian, Gestalt, to resolve our conflicts. Jungian theory is especially helpful for highly sensitive people, Erin contends, as she believes that Jung himself was hypersensitive. Spirituality is a third approach that a lot of highly sensitive people naturally gravitate towards, and it provides a sense that there is more to life than what we are currently feeling and thinking. Erin recommends that spirituality be used as a complementary therapy used in conjunction with talking therapy and possibly medication, and not exclusively. One risk is that the highly sensitive person might be too quick to abandon their ego and sacrifice themselves to a higher energy. Why is this important? Because Aaron says, for HSPs, the toughest task of all may have nothing to do with renouncing the world, but it involves going out and being immersed in it. There is finally what Aaron calls the physical approach to maintaining high sensitivity. This could mean exercise, massage, acupuncture, and a healthy diet, but it might also mean medication. HSPs are more sensitive to medications such as antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs, so it's key to always start with the lowest possible dose. 
Erin doesn't come down heavily as either for or against taking medication. She does say that medications can help during a particularly difficult and overstimulating point in your life, for example, recovering from an illness or the death of a loved one. But never take medication in an effort to cure yourself. Remember that high sensitivity is a trait, not a fatal flaw. Erin also looks at the example of the Austrian psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, who was a prisoner in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. Frankl, who Aaron believes was a highly sensitive person, sought to find meaning amid the barbarity and brutality of camp life. In Man's Search for Meaning, Frankl writes that sensitive people may have suffered much pain, but the damage to their inner selves was less. They were able to retreat to a life of inner riches. This insight that highly sensitive people could suffer less pain seems like a paradox. However, it can be understood in the sense that if you maintain a very rich inner life, you can be resilient to some extent in relation to what is happening on the outside. In this way, being highly sensitive can be a strength, not a weakness. According to Jung, people make sense of the world through four functions. Sensing, gathering information about the world based on facts and data. Thinking, making decisions based on principles. Feeling, making decisions based on one's own feelings, and intuition, seeing bigger patterns and connecting the dots, having a sort of sixth sense. Many highly sensitive people are naturally high on intuition. It's their strongest function, and they should make the most of it. That said, to function well in love and work, we also need to work on dimensions where we are weak. For Aaron, life is not about seeking perfection, but wholeness. In accepting fully who we are, we also have room to change. Before we end, let's go over everything we've learned from the highly sensitive person. First, we went over how over one quarter of the world's population identify as a potential highly sensitive person and what exactly that means. While everyone has their own ideal amount of social stimulation that they prefer, HSPs have a lower tolerance to various types of stimuli. It's important that HSPs take care of their overstimulated moments, since they can have lasting physical and mental effects. Then we covered how HSPs and the world relate. The world can misinterpret the behavior of HSPs, which often leaves them feeling underappreciated in business and in relationships. It's important to note that HSPs often have many positive qualities and can be very thoughtful and considerate co-workers or partners. Finally, Aaron suggests four methods of managing high sensitivity. First, you can consider cognitive behavioral therapy, or perhaps the second method, interpersonal therapy. Third, there's the spiritual approach. Finally, there's the physical approach. Each individual has their own way of managing how they respond to overstimulation, so any combination of these can help. Erin started out with a small cohort of 300 people to develop her thesis for the book. Many of her assertions were speculative, based on only her own experience. Other researchers have since independently verified her claims about emotional sensitivity, but there is still some ambiguity surrounding sensory processing sensitivity, which is the clinical term that is now used. Is it a real trait or another label like shyness or social anxiety? How do Aaron's highly sensitive people differ from psychologist Jerome Kagan's highly reactive people? And what is the relationship between high sensitivity and introversion? In her 2012 bestseller, Quiet, Susan Cain placed high sensitivity within a spectrum of introversion. Aaron has countered by arguing that the existence of extroverted sensitivities, apparently there are a lot of them, warrants a separate classification. Investigation into highly sensitive people and sensory processing sensitivity is in its relative infancy, and many of Aaron's assertions, such as that Jung was highly sensitive, have been made retroactively. It's clear that there is still much to explore and understand about the nature of HSPs. Whatever we might call it, one thing is clear. High sensitivity is a trait, not a flaw. It should be acknowledged and celebrated and many people are grateful to Aaron for allowing them to see and accept themselves as they are. For Aaron, 
E.M. Foster's words extol the virtues of the HSP, saying, quote, they represent the true human condition, the one permanent victory of our race over cruelty and chaos. Their pluck is not swankiness, but the power to endure. Perhaps the world could use more people who notice subtleties, are emotionally empathetic, and always look before they leap. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.